Hello, and welcome to World of Warbirds. I'm Brian Pierce. Hello, Warbirders. This is a Pratt & Whitney R4360 Wasp Major, which might be considered the culmination of the reciprocating aircraft engine. It contained 28 cylinders, displaced 4,362.5 cubic inches, which is 71 liters, which is also the equivalent of 14 Ford F-150 truck engines. The Wasp Major could produce 3,500 to 4,000 horsepower. But what does all that mean? What is displacement? What is reciprocating? Some of you might be even asking, what is a cylinder? To start our examination of aero engines, let's go back to the beginning. 12 horsepower inline four-cylinder water-cooled piston engine. This is the specification of the engine of the Wright Flyer, which could be seen as the mother of all aircraft engines. Like all the aero engines that followed it, the idea was to get the most power for the least weight. For although reciprocating engines were not new, the requirement that they be light was. For their flyer, the Wright brothers initially looked for an existing engine, or one to be produced by an existing manufacturer, but could find neither. There was no engine that would meet their requirements, which was for an engine under 200 pounds to produce at least 8 horsepower. So the Wrights were forced to do it themselves, along with their machinist, Charlie Taylor. Their 1903 engine performed splendidly, producing 12 horsepower, weighed 180 pounds, and they used the same basic model for the next couple of years until they replaced it with the Wright Vertical 4, which they used for the next six years after that. The Vertical 4 had a bigger cylinder bore, which meant more displacement or area within the cylinder. It also had its cylinders upright rather than lying horizontal, but even in these small steps, we can see the type of experimentation that would happen in the following decades as all aircraft engine builders tried to squeeze out more and more power out of their engines by every engineering trick that they could think of. So, what is a cylinder? It's literally that. A cylindrical tube, like a cannon, in which fuel is burned to produce power. But instead of a loose cannonball flying out, the cylinder contains a piston, which captures the power. So what do we mean by reciprocating? This means an engine with one or more pistons going back and forth to produce power. The power cycle of most engines is intake, compression, ignition, and exhaust. Intake, a downgoing piston draws in a charge of fuel and air. Compression, this piston, now upgoing, compresses the charge. Ignition, the squeezed fuel air charge is ignited, burns, and expands, and pushes the piston down to produce power. And exhaust, the upgoing piston completes the cycle by pushing out exhaust gases, and then the cycle starts all over again. Notice that in a four-cycle engine, the only stroke producing power is the ignition. All of this action takes place within the cylinder. So, in their unceasing quest to get more power out of their engines, engineers could start with the simple things. They could make the cylinders bigger, in order to burn a bigger charge of fuel air and thus produce more power. This cylinder size is expressed by the term displacement, meaning the size of the space within the cylinders, and is described by cubic inches or liters. The vertical four that we talked about earlier displaced 240 cubic inches, or 3.9 liters. But when it comes to aircraft engines, there's an obvious limit to cylinder size. A ship engine may have a small number of massive cylinders displacing thousands of liters each, but that's just not going to work when you're trying to fit your engine in the smallest package possible. And why are you trying to do that? The bigger the engine is, the more drag it produces as you shove it through the air. In aviation engineering, everything is compromise. So if we are limited by the size of cylinders, well, what about adding more of them? Of course, this is what they did. The Wright brothers started with four cylinders arranged in a line, which is called an inline or straight configuration. Cylinders can be added, giving us a straight six or eight. Notice that the number is always even in order to balance out the motion. 
As we add more and more cylinders to the line, eventually we hit limits again. Because the power is being transferred to a crankshaft that is getting longer and longer, more and more stiffening is required to keep the engine together and from vibrating. Even though the frontal surface of this inline engine is small and thus good for reducing aircraft drag, eventually the weight of the stiffening proves too much and designers had to come up with different arrangements. One way to do it was to split the line of cylinders and have them working against each other, sort of like one of those old-timey wood saws which had a guy at either end pushing and pulling their handle of the saw. In aircraft, these engines are known as horizontally opposed, while in cars they can be called flat or boxer engines. They take up more horizontal space, but as their motion is balanced, they can be made very light and can handle a larger number of cylinders although most are fours or sixes. My own personal 172 has a six-cylinder horizontally opposed engine. Another way to get more power is to start arranging the ever-increasing number of cylinders in different configuration banks. One is the V, where the two banks of cylinders lean away from each other. You've probably heard of a V6 or a V8, but V engines can be built with 10, 12, and all the way up to a monster V24 model, which was actually two V12s mounted one behind the other, and was only used for the Machi MC72, an experimental Italian seaplane that was competing for the Schneider Trophy. This one-off engine powered the seaplane on its record-setting flight with a speed of 440.7 miles per hour, that's 709.2 kilometers per hour. No other seaplane has ever gone faster, and the plane was retired following the flight. However, the most common V configuration for aircraft use was the V-12, which seemed to be the perfect compromise. Many, many of the warbirds I talk about on this channel are powered by V-12 engines, such as the British Rolls-Royce Merlin and Griffin, the Soviet Klimov VK-107, and Mikulin AM-38, the American Allison V-1710, and the German Daimler-Benz DB-600 and Junkers Jumo 211. Although Allied V-12s were upright, meaning the cylinder heads were on top, German designers flipped theirs upside down with their inverted V engines. Because more of the engine mass was at the bottom, these had a lower center of gravity and improved the pilot's visibility to boot. In the quest to put more and more cylinders, some engine designers tried sticking together these various configurations and gearing them together to a common shaft and then to the propeller. Putting two horizontally opposed banks on top of each other produced an H engine, such as the 24-cylinder British Napier Sabre, which powered the Hawker Typhoon and Tempest. Putting a V-bank on top and then another V-bank upside down underneath makes an X engine, such as the 24-cylinder Rolls-Royce Vulture engine, which was built by putting two Rolls-Royce Peregrine V-12s on top of each other. The Vulture powered the Avro Manchester heavy bomber, which was a failure, but which led to the Avro Lancaster, which was not. My video on the Lank provides all the details of that story. A similar engine type was developed in Germany for the Heinkel HE 177 Greif, or Griffin. Part of the design of this fast bomber was to have only two engines, in order to reduce the drag in not having four engine nacelles. This meant that with only two engines, each of them needed to be producing about 2,000 horsepower. German industry just didn't have a reliable engine with that power output, so they decided to take two Daimler-Benz DB601 liquid-cooled inverted V12s, and they mounted them together in one nacelle, coupled to turn a single prop. This unit was known as a DB606 power system. Now, the 601 was a very reliable engine and was used to power such aircraft as the Messerschmitt BF-109 E and F and BF-110 C to F. However, the DB-606 power system got a very bad name due to its installation in the HE-177. 
There just wasn't enough space in the nacelle, leading to overheating in parts of the engine, which in turn caused foaming of the lubricating oil, which meant that the parts of the engine were being damaged. The great heat between the conjoined engines meant that any leaking fuel or oil would trigger a catastrophic engine fire. The crews of the 177 had a nickname for the plane, and it's not really a term of endearment either. Reich Fugzeug, the Reich's lighter, or Luftwaffen Fugzeug, Air Force lighter. Goring himself hated the engines, calling them welded together engines. However, it wasn't the engines themselves that were the problem, but their installation in the 177. The same power system was used in two other aircraft, the Heinkel HE-119 and the Messerschmitt ME-261, and there they worked fine. The Rolls-Royce Griffin was the end of the line for this aircraft engine producer when it came to piston engines. This liquid-cooled 37 liter, that's 2,240 cubic inches, V12 started as a request from the fleet air arm asking for a more powerful Merlin. The Griffin was an updated Merlin, and although it was only slightly physically larger than its predecessor, it displaced 10 more liters. It was also designed from the start to have a supercharger and ended up producing 2,400 horsepower. The Avro Shackleton, Ferry Firefly, Hawker Tempest, Supermarine Spitfire, and Spiteful were all powered by Griffins. These engines have even powered air racers and tractor pullers right up into the modern era. Another British engine, the Napier Sabre, was an H24 cylinder, liquid-cooled engine with sleeve valves rather than the usual poppet valves that almost all other engines used and still use. Sleeve valves work by having ports in the engine walls that come into alignment with the cylinder's inlet and exhaust ports at the right time in the combustion cycle. At one time, this technology was thought to be superior to poppet valves because the earlier poppets would build up carbon which needed to be removed. However, changes in the technology reduced this problem which took the sleeve valve design out of favor. However, the Napier Sabre engine was improved during the era to become one of the most powerful inline piston aircraft engines in the world, developing from 2,200 horsepower in its earlier versions to 3,500 horsepower in late model prototypes. Although the development of the engine took a long time and a lot of tinkering, it ended up powering Hawker Typhoons and Tempests, which were used to chase down and destroy V-1 flying bombs, and they also shot down 20 Messerschmitt ME-262 jet aircraft. I have seen a Sabre up close at the Canadian Aviation and Space Museum in Ottawa and can attest that it is a hopelessly complex, but at the very same time, very beautiful machine that can stand as a piece of art as well as an engine to make power out of gasoline. Now there is a completely different configuration that we have yet to talk about. That is putting the cylinders in a circle, which was known as a rotary or radial engine and will be the subject of the next video. If you haven't subscribed, make sure you do so that you don't miss a thing. I hope you enjoy this slight diversion from my normal content and get a better understanding of what we are talking about when we look at various aircraft with different engine types. Let me know in the comments if you like this kind of diversion, and if you really appreciate it, send me a super thanks or become a member. Until next time.